Um, my name is Matthew McDermott, and uh, I'm having trouble with my slides. Um, if you're going to be tweeting about the session, go ahead and use uh, IW416. That's this session, Solving Enterprise Search Challenges with SharePoint. If you have a nice thing to say, go ahead and shoot it out to um, IW416. If you have bad things to say, send it out to IT115. That's uh, Spence's session that he just wrapped up. Um, my name is Matt McDermott. I'm a SharePoint MVP. I'm based out of Austin, Texas. And I, um, I work for a company called Aptalon with um, four other MVPs, um, three of, two of which, three counting me, I'm having trouble with math, um, were, uh, were speakers here at the event. I live in Austin with my wife and my dog, Ruby. And uh, we take Ruby pretty much everywhere we can. Sadly, we can't bring her here. But she and I compete. I'm a dog guy. You're going to see dogs all through the demo. One of the things I love about doing the demos with this is I get to show off all my friends' dogs. I did help write a book called The SharePoint uh, 2010 Expert Practices. And uh, I train with Critical Path. But if you want to reach me, you can reach me on Twitter at Matthew McD. You can check out my blog. At the end of the deck, I'll have a bit.ly to a blog post where I'm pulling together all the artifacts from all of my sessions here. And uh, once I wrap up things today, I'll update that post and you'll be able to get it off of, um, off of my blog. And if you have any questions, if you have to dash out and just have questions that come up later based on the content that we've been talking about, give me a frame of reference in an email that you know that, I, that you are here, so that way I know what lies I told and have to justify in a reply back to you. And, uh, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. What I'd like to talk about, though, is um, search center configuration. Since this is the IW track, I'm going to try to keep it at an IW level but it's important to know that in SharePoint 2013, they have taken so much of what was in the search, um, the search application exclusively, and they've pushed that to the site collection and even down to the site. And this is really exciting for building search solutions, because quite often, IT wants to fire and forget. If you say we want to go crawl this file share, you have them configure the crawl, and then we have entire control over what to do with those search results once they're in our site collection. That was not the case in 2010. So we'll do some demos around the 2010 time frame and show you how much better it's gotten for 2013. We'll also talk about some of the new concepts in, in uh, searching that IW, that um, information workers, site collection administrators, and site administrators can manage inside of SharePoint 2013. Display templates, the end user search settings, these new things called result types, and these new things called query rules, and just how powerful this whole infrastructure has become. I'm going to start with the demo of what was, how we used to do search center changes in SharePoint 2010. And um, what I'm going to do is jump over to my virtual machine here. That's 2013. That's 2010. So here's our 2010 search center. And I have, um, I've configured one extra tab in the main page for customers. And if I jump into and do a ser SharePoint search, what's on screen now is a set of best bets at the top. These were configured for the search center for SharePoint, my keyword. And then down below, I have my search results. Generally, what we would want to do if we're configuring the search center is we want to go in and make some changes to the search center. We want to enhance the way these results look to try to get our users more engaged and provide them with more actionable results. So I might create a tab like this one that, demo that shows off just images. And it shows it off in a little bit nicer way than the, um, than the lack of thumbnails in the, um, in the main search page. So if I go back here and I search on Willa, um, it renders a series of images with the image metadata below it so that the end users can then click on that and see the entire image. In this case, this is Willa studying for her SharePoint exam. Um, the, uh, the point is that in SharePoint 2010, we had the ability to customize this search UI. And the way that we would do that is create a new page. And so I'm going to go to um, my site actions menu. And if I choose to create a new page, by default, it's going to create a search results page. If I want to create a different kind of page, then I can go to the um, view all site content here, and I can go into the pages library, and I can then create a new page inside the pages library. And this gives me the ability to create any kind of search results page. So if I've created a custom search results 
page layout, like with jQuery on it, I could go in here and select that page layout if I wanted to. In this case, I'm just going to create an Evo results page. And we'll call that page Evo results. And it's going to end up getting an ASPX file extension. And I'll choose to create that page. Once the page is created, there's a couple of obstacles that we have to get past. One of them is that by default, this page, come on, by default, this web part at the top of the page is configured to go back to the default results page. So if you notice here at the top, wait, got to get my zoomer going. Here we go. If you notice here at the top, the URL is evoresults.aspx. It's the page that we just created. But generally, the end user experience that you want is when someone submits a search, you want it to come back to the page that, you're, that they were on. By default, this page is configured to go to the results page. So I'm going to go back and fix that. So I'm going to go to the page. I'm going to edit the page. And then once I'm in the page, I'm going to edit the search box and go down to the most important section of any search part. That's the miscellaneous. And down under here, it has the target search results page. And so that's where I'm going to put in Evo for my Evo results page. And now when I execute a search from that page, it should stay on the page. And in fact, it does. The other, the other behavior that you're seeing is that it always takes the keyword that's in the search box and appends it to the query string. Because these search web parts, they're kind of smart and kind of dumb. They just look at any, query, any item in the query string that has k equals and uses that as the keyword query. So we can leverage those on other pages if we want. But what I want to do now that I have my search results is I want to start customizing them. And so in SharePoint 2010, this was nightmarish. Because ordinarily, what you would do is you would edit the page. And if you hadn't read any of the blog posts that I've written about how bad this experience is, you would go edit page. You would go over to the, um, the uh, core results web part panel here. You would uncheck use location visualization, because that's so intuitively obvious that that means I want to customize this. And then you would hit the XSL editor. OK, this has got to be the biggest joke title of anything in SharePoint, because this, ladies and gentlemen, is not an editor. This is the first portal on the way to hell. Because inside this portal, you have absolutely no syntax highlighting. You have, um, you have line wrapping, but it's really scary the way it does line wrapping. So what I do instead is I control A, control C, and I close that down just as fast as I can. I jump back over to SharePoint Designer, and I browse into my site collection, into the files in the site collection. And I move down, and I, in my case, I just go down into the style library, into the XSL style sheets. I'm going to be editing XSL. It just makes sense that I'm going to throw this stuff in here. So in, inside here, I'm going to create a new file. It doesn't matter what file extension I give it. I'm going to rename it to SPEVO results.xsl. Yes, I want to change the file extension. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and open this in advanced mode, and then I'm going to paste in all of that code. And what you'll notice after a second is that SharePoint Designer's syntax highlighting is going to kick in, and at least I'm one step closer to having a decent editing experience. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to throw in a little token so that you know that I'm not, I'm not fooling you. I'm just going to do a search here on results because I want to find this template match in XSL. That's going to be my first result. And so right after that result, I'm going to put in the words SP SharePoint Evolution. That way, for every result that gets kicked out to the page, I'll see that text. And I'll just know that from then on, I can start editing this page. Now, what I have to do is tell the search web part that I'm using this page. I do that by choosing properties and copying this, oops, copying this string. And then I go back to my search web part. I close this up. I go back down to the most important section, miscellaneous. 
drop down here to XSL link, and I paste in the location of that style sheet into the web part. Once I've done that, I can check in the page, and after a query is executed, you'll notice that I'm seeing SP evolutions underneath each one of these results. So at this point, I've now taken control of the XSL, and at this point, I can start binging my life away to find out how to do XSL, okay? And while you're doing that, here's an important note. I tell my customers when I'm working with them, because they'll ask me, how do I know if this blog article is valuable? How do I know if I should take this advice? And I say I have a couple of examples. One of them is, if you're using SharePoint 2010, was it written sometime in the last two years? Because if it wasn't written in the last two years, it's probably not current enough for the current builds. They may be addressing a bug that no longer exists, a number of other examples. If they spell SharePoint with a lower P, close the browser. Okay? They don't know what they're talking about. But the whole date thing is important because if you're doing XSL and you're using Bing to go find XSL help, if the blog post was written since 2006, ignore it because it's still using the old version of XSL. We get none of the great new features that are built into present day XSL processors. So this is a drag. This has gotten significantly better in 2010. What I'm going to show you is that you can, there is a lot that you can do. Did I say 2010? Um, there's a lot that you can do. I'm going to do a pet store search here. There's a lot that you can do with XSL. This is a 2010 search portal that I put together um, as an example for customers. I have search refiners. I have my search results. I have a rest call out to Bing so that I can take the address of the location and I can send it out there and, um, and get a map of that location. This was awful to create an XSL. It was very, very challenging. When we do that in 2013, the, the, uh, the benefits become pretty obvious pretty quickly. So let me jump over to search here, and I'll talk, I'm going to walk you through the same exact process, but it's how we do it in 2013. Okay? The first thing you have to realize is that when you're doing a search in SharePoint 2013, you are getting different kinds of results back, just like you were in 2010. But the difference is each result is processed independently, which means instead of getting back 100 rows of XML and having to plan in my XSL a for each, for each kind of content, and then when my administrators go add some new content, I've got to now go back to my XSL and plan for that. I now can think of what am I going to change? I'm going to change what a person looks like, or I'm going to change what a Word document looks like. Okay? So let's say that we want to change what a, I'll make it easy on myself, let's just change what a person looks like. I'm going to do the same exact demo that I did in 2010, but I'm going to do it in 2013, and I'm just going to put SP Evo on here after, let's say, after the name. So the first thing I do is I go into Design Manager. So here's Design Manager off of the cog. And remember, if you're in SharePoint and you're working, it's this cog right here. It's not this cog right here. Okay? I, I really pity the help desk on that one. So then I'm going to go into, uh, yeah, mom, no, it's not the top cog. It's the cog, no, mom, it's the cog below that. Um, display templates, okay, this is the library where all of the display templates are held. It's just a SharePoint, um, a SharePoint document library. But what you want to do is go to upload design files and then open this link and it'll open an explorer view to the um, master page gallery. Then you can go into display templates, and you can choose the ones for search. In case I forget to tell you later, if you decide to do all this stuff with refiners, which use the exact same technology, that's up here under filters. Okay, so these are the refiners, and these are the um, SharePoint um, um, display templates. So I'm going to go down here, and um, I'm going to find the item person, which is right here, and you'll notice there's a pair of these. For every file, for every HTML file, there's a sister JS file. Don't mess with the JS file. SharePoint manages those. If you delete the HTML, it'll come back and clean up the JS. When you provision a new HTML, it'll provision a JS. Don't mess with the JS file. So what I'm going to do is copy this to the, uh, copy this to the desktop. And I'm going to rename it. 
very first thing you should do is rename that file. So I'm going to call this Evo person. And then I'm going to edit this in Notepad. Because it doesn't matter what tool you use to edit. You can use your favorite text editor. You can use Visual Studio if you want. You can use SharePoint Designer still. But you can, um, I like using Notepad++. It's just very quick. The first thing you want to do once you've opened this is retitle it. Because when this gets uploaded to that library, it's going to use the title attribute to put it into the select box you're going to see later. If you leave it the same, it's going to, you're going to have duplicates. It's going to be hard to figure out which one's yours. Um, as I go down into this, as I said, here is my username right there, the name value. Look, it's HTML. Um, and there's my div. So right here, I'm going to go SP Evolution. I'm going to save the file. And now I can close this guy. And I can drag him back in, let it go. You'll notice it copied it in. It's down here at the bottom. I'm going to hit F5. And you'll notice now there's an item Evo person JS. So SharePoint just creates that sister file for me. Now what I have to do is associate, I have to associate the file that I just created with the results that I want to show using that file. So I'm going to go back to site settings. I'm going to go into result types. I'm going to cheat and find the person result type and just copy it. And this is going to be my Evo person. I'm going to leave all the values the same except for this um, this selection. I'm going to tell it to use my SP Evo people item. If I had not changed the name in the file, this would say people item. I would have two of them. Okay? If you upload yours, this drove me crazy for about a half a day until I remembered that I was using SharePoint. If you upload yours and you forget to change the name, you can still go in here, right out of SharePoint, and you can edit these items in your favorite editor. If you retitle it and save it, it won't retitle it on the list. And it's actually using the list value. So if that happens, you can either just delete the file and upload it again, um, or you can go back into the, uh, the design manager, go back into the design manager, and go back to edit display templates, and then just edit it here. So you can go here. It's just a list item. Choose edit properties and change the name here and then it'll change it in the select list. So that's just a little, a little word, word of warning from uh, someone who's been there and tried to figure out how to get those names right without actually deleting the file. OK, so I'm going to do that same search. Do a search for SharePoint. I'm going to jump over to the People tab. And right away, you'll notice here's SP, uh, here's SP Evolution. OK, so it's only a little bit more complicated in terms of getting the wiring set up. You have to upload the file, and then you have to create a rule to say, when this happens, show this file. And I'll be going into a lot more detail on that in later demos. But the advantage is I get to work on one item at a time. It doesn't show up on the Everything tab unless there's actually a, uh, unless there's a people hit that actually shows my display template. In this case, these are different display templates, so it's not showing. So I can, it's very unobtrusive when you're working with these display templates. OK. So in SharePoint 2010, we had XSL. We used SharePoint Designer. And we had to edit with the entire result set in mind. OK. We also had to edit knowing that our XSL was only going to, only going to apply and all of our rules were only going to apply if the search center was using my XSL. If I create a new page, it's not using my XSL anymore. So not global. It, it was, it was an awful experience. I mean, it was better than 2007, but it was, it was still horrible. So we had the joke of the XSL editor and the portal. <laughs> and now in 2013, we're using HTML. We can use any text editor that we want. We work with one result type at a time, and we get hover panels for free. So when you're thinking about the way that a, um, the, the way that a search result looks, we get not only do we get the search result itself, but then we also have an infrastructure that's set up with an associated hover panel. So when you start thinking about how you want your end users to interact with SharePoint and in the search center, it's up to you to decide 
or up to a designer who knows absolutely nothing about SharePoint to decide what this stuff looks like. And then they can give us the design files and we can turn them into these display templates. The other huge, in, huge investment that Microsoft has made is they have pushed so much of the control of search down to the site collection and the site. Anybody know why? The cloud. What's that? And so they pushed it down. They don't know what to do with it, so they pushed it down to us. Could be, could be, could be that all our, all our complaining has finally paid off. No, it's the cloud, right? You don't get to be a search administrator. You don't get to administer the search service application in the cloud. What you get is tenant administration. And as a tenant administrator, you can establish crawl sources and things like that, but then you also push all of the... All of the uh, um, Managed, managed properties and all of the query rules down to the site collection level. Okay? So what I want to show you is in 2010, if I'm on my search center here, or if I go to, here, let's tell you what, let's go to the, in, my intranet search center, and if I go into site settings, now what I have is a whole bunch of features related to search. So from a web level alone, I have the control over result sources, result types, and query rules. Schema is the new name for, man, for uh, the managed properties. And then my search settings, my searchable columns, etc. cetera. If I, uh, if I go in here to my result sources, the only thing you can't do from here is set up new content sources. You can't go crawl a file share from your site collection. Okay, but you get to control everything else. So once IT has configured that crawl, then we can start working on it from inside of SharePoint. So in this case, what I'm looking at are these things called result sources. And what they do, they're almost equivalent to what we had in 2010 when we were talking about scopes. Scopes go away in 2013, and we now have result sources. But result sources are significantly more powerful in that I can define what I want to connect to I can use different protocols. So if I want to use an open search protocol to do federated, uh, federated search, I can do that. I can also connect to remote SharePoint servers and use their search. So most of the time, you're going to be doing local SharePoint and working your way through. But in this case, I now have the ability to connect to um, remote SharePoint sites, um, 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 oh, anything supporting the open search standard, and exchange from a result source. And then I have a query transformation that I can do. So for instance, if I'm going to connect to a remote server, I'm going to send the search terms to that server, but maybe that server also needs some additional information in the query string. I can add that here, or I can even transform the query altogether so that people don't get, um, so people get a better search experience. The other thing that I have in search settings, the other thing that I have in search settings is my search schema. So the search schema is what we used to call um, ma our managed properties. But if you'll notice, there are so many more properties available to us to decorate the, um, the terms in the, in the uh, managed property list. So the first one, type and multi, that's basically the data type and whether it's multi-value or not. And then I have attributes. Can I query it? Can it be included in the index? Can it actually be retrieved? So we have some, um, we have some properties that, although they are in the index, they're not retrievable because we don't want to send them back out. We don't want them to be searched on. Sortable. Now you can define sorts for any managed property. That's a big deal. People have been asking for that in SharePoint forever. The only way we got that was in 2010 was with Fast for SharePoint. So now I can define sortable properties. Safe means if I'm executing an anonymous query, if I'm executing an anonymous query, am I going to return this property? So you may not want necessarily, you may not want to send all of the properties out to the UI unless you know who that user is. And that property allows you to do that. And then we manage these properties. We map them to the crawled properties out of the system. And so the value of using managed properties 
is that it's significantly faster than crawling the site. So in this case, like the about me property happens to be mapped to the people attribute about me, but any, any um, SharePoint site that's using a notes field, because that's the OWS underscore, will also populate that about me. Okay? So in this way, we've kind of equated these two fields to the about me property. But I now have this control, never had it before at the site collection level. I now have this control at the site collection level. What I can do is I inherit all of the ones from the farm, and then I can add my own new ones in here. I think that's cool. Probably the most significant change is this tenant administration in SharePoint 2010, or 2013. If you set them, so the question was, um, are they only available at the site collection? That's correct. If I set it at the site collection level, they're available to me at the site collection level and every subsite. If I do it at the web level, it's just that web. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that you're going to want to have 17 search centers, but if you think about the impact that search has on SharePoint, it's also content. Um, it's also content by search parts, if you've seen some of the WCM demos. And it's also search sites that are search driven, like knowledge management portals and things like that, would also benefit from having these unique settings. Correct. You can't modify crawled properties, just, just um, managed properties. That's two different questions. Okay, the first question was, can you change managed properties? No. I mean, can you change crawled properties? No. But if you add new properties to a site, if you add new columns to a list, if you add new site columns to a site, you can trigger a recrawl of that site from this administration panel. Okay? So, what I've read so far, I'm still learning this, that part of it. Because I'm, I'm really, uh, I really work on the back end a lot, and I've been trying to push my demos more and more into here. But um, I, I believe that it is not required to be a site column to become, OK, let me say it this way. I know that if you just create a regular list column, when it's recrawled, it will become a crawled property. But if you use site columns, they automatically become managed properties. And there's a known naming convention for those that's been documented on MSDN and TechNet. Okay. It includes a queue, and includes TXT for the field type, and somewhere in there is your field name, but it's predictable, okay? as opposed to the underscore in your name sometimes becoming percent %20 and sometimes not, and sometimes it's X0020. Yeah, now it's predictable. Now, the last thing I want to show you on here is these two links right here, configuration import and configuration export. For the developers in the room, for the IT pros in the room that are working with developers, a developer will work on his development box, set up all the managed properties, set up all of these mappings, create all of this great configuration, create an app that can go against that, and then he tries to do it against the intranet after they've configured everything exactly the same as my box, and it doesn't work. Now what you're able to do is actually export the configuration of all the managed properties that you've put in and then import them into a new site, web, or farm. So that's a big deal. We now have portability in our search settings. The only thing, as I understand it, the only thing that it does not export is the display templates. It'll, dis it'll export the association to the display template, so the JS file in the rule is going to be in there, but you still have to, put the dis you have to either deploy or move the, the display templates yourself um, to make sure that those associations stay valid. My understanding, yes, it is. Yeah, you still have to do a full crawl. But when you're, in the, uh, when you're in the site collection, you can go into, I think it's under search settings. Um, oh, I should also say that we're not using a list for tabs anymore. We now have actual navigation provider for our tabs. Um, let me show it. I know it's on the list, so let me show you that. If I go into uh, my site contents, and I go to documents, There was, I'm looking for it in here. 
I'll have to find it. I'm off script right now, so I'm, I'm struggling to find it. But there is a, um, there is a way to tell SharePoint to, there it is, re-index document library. Okay, so you can go in and you can say re-index the document library and the crawler will pick that up as a task and it'll come back and recrawl this document library for you. And there's throttling settings and all kinds of stuff on the back end to prevent every user in your entire environment from tripping the crawl all at the same time. So don't be worried about that. But, um, but suffice to say, the important part here is that if I need to recrawl my content, I can trip it from my site collection and I think it's on a 15 minute timer job It'll get picked up and you'll start seeing your crawled properties show up. Okay? You can also, comments related, you can also go to specific documents and say recrawl the document. Yes, you can. Yeah, so you're basically submitting a task with a URL back to the engine to come back and do that. All right. So, um, so lots of changes in the site collection. We have our site collection administrators and site administrators now have access to the, um, to the search settings. Um, in 2010, this was all we had. We had search settings, search scope, search keywords, and then we had fast search keywords. This used to drive me nuts because my clients used to think they had fast. Well, I know I have fast. I have it in the UI. So you know you don't have fast because you still have money in your pocket. <laughs> um, so, then, then, uh, so what we have now in 2013 is significantly more control at the site collection as well as at the site. So even if you are a lowly web administrator, you still have the ability to go in and work with these particular attributes. You will inherit everything from above, and you can change the ranking of the, uh, of the rules and how, they are, um, how, they're, excuse me, how they're configured. You can't delete them, but you can view them, and you can reorder them. So when we talk about SharePoint 2013 results, it starts with an end user query. The end user query is submitted to the query rules engine, and the query rules engine looks at the query and then passes it on to the index. The index, of course, was previously built based on crawls. The, those results are returned, evaluated, and then result types are applied. Okay? So the result types are what help drive the presentation to our display templates. So one-to-one -one mapping between a result type and a display template. It's the order of the rules that determines which display template gets applied. So you could create five person display templates and have five different rules based on how that display template was presented. Okay? So for instance, you could have a display template that was if you are in the UK, if your office location was in the UK, you could have a flag of that country next to those people. And if your office location, this is a demo to come sometime after the conference. But it allows you to actually have, this, you could have the same copy of the display template subtly modified and then have result type rules that, that drive how that display template works. Does that make sense? Do you understand the power of that? It is so amazing. There is so much. I did a session um, yesterday on... Uh, building, search, building search applications. I did the same session last year, and it was 90% compiled code. I did that same session this year, it was like 5% compiled code. Because there's so much in the UI now that we can use to build these rules and be able to create these great um, end user resources. So when you create a result type, you start out by pre um, uh, preparing the managed properties in the search schema, and then you design the display template. Once the display template's complete, you create the result type and you connect the display template to it, and then you can preview it in search. So you can kind of work through this preview cycle, if you like, to get the, uh, get the display templates to work. But making, these manage making the, um, the, dis the display template and the result type connection was a, was a learning curve for me. So when we're working with display templates, we get to not use XSL. There's sort of a fallback mode, but hang with it, use the, use the default rendering, and, and go with uh, straight, at, straight uh, HTML. You're dealing with one result at a time. You're also global. Any search done in the site where your display template and rules are applied will use your display templates. So I now, if I move from tab to tab to tab, I don't have to have four different flavors of XSL. I can go from tab to tab to tab, and if my result type rule fires, my display template's going to be presented, and that's very powerful. 
It's also the same technology that's being used for refiners. So out of the box, there's a slider refiner, graphical refiner that you get. Um, in my session yesterday, I presented um, a, a, a colleague's code that shows how to do a, a bar chart using jQuery. But now we have client rendering. We now have the ability to go after these refiners with client code to make these end user experiences much better. And then finally, we have room for customization. So what I want to do is show you how we built the, um, this little Bing Maps integrated, um, integrated display template and just sort of walk through the process of how that, how that all comes together. So we have a display template that when oh, in the wrong search center. So we have a display template here that's, the, uh, that's the, our, our pet store display template. And it's showing up a little funky over on the side because of the way the screen is smashed up. But the idea here is I have a, I have a customer display template, and then I have the customer hover item. Okay, So I have the hover panel and the display template, two separate files that are just joined together by a reference from the display template on the page. The other thing to note is that my refiner here, if, if I jump over to my customer center, all of these refiners, all of these refiners are out of the box, okay? So actually, let me start by talking about how those refiners are configured because I just, I absolutely love this. So I'm gonna do edit page, and I'm gonna go in here to the refiners, choose edit web part, and now there's a button. This is the refiner designer. Inside this, I've got my fields that I've selected to show as refiners down the left side. I chose them from a list of available refiners. Remember those managed properties? Remember they had the refinement true? That's what makes them show up here. Okay, if you want to refine on that, then, make, then go ahead and select that. Um, for the year-to-date sales, which is that slider, I simply selected year-to-date sales. I chose the slider with bar graph. And then since I didn't like the way these sample values came out, less than 12349, 12349 to here, I went ahead and put in my own custom thresholds. So I have 1,000, 10,000, 25,000, 50,000, and on up. You can even preview the changes that you've made based on the search that's already been executed on the page. So when you go to do this, execute a search on the page so it shows you what you're working with, and then you can preview these refiners right on the page, and they're actually interactive. So I just chose silver, and you notice all the little silver metals that are there. So um, if I go down to my year-to-date sales, I can change that, and I have one result. So that's the same experience that I want to see when I go to my, um, when I go to my page. I'm going to check in the page, choose continue, and then down here I have my year-to-date sales slider. So just a really powerful capability because now I have um, JavaScript and HTML that I can use in these, in these display templates or in my refiners. So let me talk about how I built this one. I'm going to go back into my display templates and I'm going to open up that customer display template. I copied, here's the other tip, look at your results Decide, does that look like a document result? Does it look like a PowerPoint result? And then choose the item, choose the display template that's already there out of the box. Start with that one that's close. I chose one that was a, uh, a, an image or a document because I wanted this nice big fat um, preview panel. And so I went in, I made a copy of it, and now I have my item customer HTML. And I also have my item customer hover panel. The only thing that's in the item customer HTML is this string right here, which says, um, wait a sec, it's right down here. Right here, the, uh, the hover panel, the hover URL, I just had to tell it to go to my item, custom hover, item customer hover panel. Once I did that, I just closed it down, I'm done, okay? Um, then I, get, I go to my item customer hover panel and I start doing my coding in here. Once I set up my result type rule, that's what establishes the wiring between the customer item and the customer hover panel because of that JavaScript. 
then I will start working with my designers because now I know I have the plumbing working. So now I work with my designers to come up with this wonderful look and feel and I get all that working. So this, all of this look and feel is in the item customer. So what you'll see in the display, pan, in the display templates is a, a bunch of token replacements. So here's the email literal and then inside that email literal is a mail to link. It's an href with a mail to. And then you'll start seeing these tokens. Okay? That's a begin, that's an end. This is a begin, over here is an end. Okay? So what SharePoint's going to do is it's going to swap out these tokens for tokens from the, the master JavaScript file that's running. So I have my context of my current item. This is my managed property name. Does that make sense? So when my designer gave this to me, he had Matthew McDermott, 123 Anytown. He had my name in there. I just went in and found my first name and swapped it out with this token. Found my last name and swapped it out with a last name token. So I'm able just to go through his file, his static HTML file, and turn it into um, a display template. Then you need to tell the file what managed properties to use. This used to be a separate setting in the search control in 2010. Now it's all embedded in the display template. Right here is the managed property mapping attribute. And in the managed property at mapping attribute, it has all of the fields that we're pulling in. And way out here at the end, you'll start seeing Doghouse Toys company name, title, last name. So each of those it's, it's always this pair because one is an alias and one is the actual managed property name. Each of those is used down below. Likewise, on the hover panel, I'm doing a, uh, a call out to um, I'm doing a call out to Bing to render that image. Let me see where we are here. Let's go. Here it is. So I'm doing a call out to Bing. Bing has a REST service that returns map imagery. So knowing that, all I have to do is put in this where one attribute and then start constructing an address. Address line one, address uh, city, state, zip, etc., country and region. I'm not going to keep going because it has my private key for how I get the results back, because you do have to apply a private key and get, a, get an account with Bing to be able to do this. But that's all you have to do, and then every time this runs, it goes and fetches the map. So if I hover over the item, so if I go back here, I choose, uh, I choose to hover over the item, it's giving me the map in the hover card of the actual location. So display templates have targets. I've been showing you standard display templates. The target most often is going to be an item display template, which is going to be in the body of the search page as shown here. But you can also have a hover panel, which is over there. You can also have a filter display template. That's a refiner. You can have a group display template, which in, that, in this case, it's this horizontal people part. But it's called the people intent item, if you're looking for it and you want to create your own. I want to do this with videos. I want to do like four little videos across the middle there, and you can do that. There's also a control display template. The search boxes, the paging parts, those are all display templates now. And the control type is the one that they're using for those. So if you're trying to figure out which part of the page you want to affect, you're going to choose one of those different display templates to achieve that. The last thing I want to talk about is query rules. With query rules, we now have an engine that's significantly better than the way we did best bets or any other search suggestions. I'll show you a couple of different, um, different samples of some of the best bets that we get now. But you can also detect who the user is and take action. So for instance, that example I gave you before, where if I know the user is from a certain location, I can actually have access to their, the user profile. So I can say where user dot country equals, and I can start specifying those kinds of display templates using query rules. I can also act on the user's intent. I'll give you an example of that when I, when I go in, but when you do a search in SharePoint 2013, if you say SharePoint deck, there's already a rule in there that says, oh, I know what a deck is. A deck is a PowerPoint presentation. So it looks for just items that have PPT or PPTX. So you can do, if, uh, if you call movies flicks, 
and someone types in flicks, and you want to show them videos, you can do that kind of rule. And then the last one is the result blocks. You saw that in the people results. So you can create these result blocks that are either pinned to the top like, like best bets were, or even cooler, you can have them float based on relevance. So think about this. I'm the author of, of many, many, many Word documents. So when I do a search, author Matthew McDermott's going to return hundreds of hits. So it's not very relevant for me to have a, here are your documents that you're missing because you're not a very good searcher. But for my salespeople, they're terrible searchers and they're always looking for the same thing. They're always looking for the documents that they just authored. So what I do for them is I have a query rule that says these are your documents. Author equals the person who just executed the query. But if I want, what I can do is I can either pin it to the top, here are always your documents, or I can float that based on relevance. So somebody like me, I would never see it, whereas the salespeople, it would pop right to the top. So let me show you a couple query rules. One of the first ones I want to show you is one that most folks tried to do in 2010, but they said you could only do it with uh, Fast for SharePoint. So we did get some good stuff from the, uh, from the Fast team. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to create what we used to call a visual best bet. If I go into my site contents, what I'll see in the documents library is that I have this amazing graphic of two people trying to learn SharePoint. And it says, dude, take a class. And when you click on it, it takes you to the training site. Well, I want to use that. I want to use that in my search results when somebody, when, somebody is, um, when somebody is working and looking for SharePoint. So I'm going to go into my site settings. Actually, I'm going to have to go back and find that again, so bear with me. Go get the URL for that. I'm going to go back into uh, site contents, go into my document library. I'm going to choose this guy, and I'm just going to copy the URL. Now, in site settings, I'm going to go into my query rules, and I'm going to create a new query rule on SharePoint content. We're going to call this training. So if the qu query matches, that's not what I want. What I want is add an remove that, add a condition. When the query contains an action term, advanced query text match, query contains one of these phrases, SharePoint. Let's make it like a best bet. We'll throw in some synonyms, SPS, MOS, and WSS. And all I care about is if the, uh, if the query matches exactly, and then I'm going to move down here and I'm going to add a promoted result. So this is where I would do SharePoint training. If I enter the URL and don't do anything else, it's simply going to put a link up on the page. But what I want it to do is render the URL as a banner. Okay, so this is the make it a visual best bet link. If I don't do that, it's just going to render the URL in a description. So we'll choose Save there. I can, if I have multiples, I can um, change the ranking. I'll choose Save here. And then I'm going to go back to my Search Center. And I'm going to search for SharePoint. And there it is. So it shows up right in the page. You can, you can uh, you know, hopefully you have better graphic artists than I do. But um, I, I really like that as a demo because it shows you that you can really focus people on the search center. These also have timing settings. So you can publish it next Monday and have it go all way next Friday. You can also take action on who the user is. So maybe the training is happening in San Antonio and your office is in Austin. Or let's say the training is happening in Manchester and your office is in London. Um, how'd I do? About two hours, two hours away? OK. Um, then you could have that training. If the person's office is in Manchester, then show them this. Otherwise, don't. Okay? Or show them a different one. If they're in London, show them the London training banner. You know? Um, you know, you'd have Big Ben up there, or for Manchester, you'd have people fighting, right? Um, <laughs> soccer fans. Soccer fans fighting. Okay. All right. So, um, so what I want to do, so I did the visual best bets. I did the result types. I want to make sure I got through all of the demos that I wanted to show you. And I believe I did. Actually, let me show you one other that I really like. So if you think about when you search, 
when you're searching for SharePoint, there is this rule down here. There's this rule down here that's doing a people search using your keyword. Okay, so this is anybody who puts SharePoint anywhere on their profile shows up right there. And this is also a great opportunity for, you to show, for me to show you two of my dogs. That's Eric Shups's dog. That's Christina Wheeler's dog. Anyway, um, so it's a good search, but it's not a great search because these aren't my SharePoint experts. Well, they are, but these are people who have SharePoint on their profile. What I want to see is people who actually say in their profile, it is a skill of mine. I am an expert about this. Okay? We'll call them the SharePoint team. So I'm going to go back into my query rules. Come on. There we go. I'm going to go back into my query rules. And I'm going to create a new query rule. And we'll do this one on local SharePoint results. We'll create the query rule. We call the SharePoint team. And so if they're looking for SharePoint, if they're looking for SharePoint, like we did before, oh, you know what? I can just reuse. Let's do this. This is, this is the other cool thing about query rules, is I can add, since I've already got this rule working for SharePoint, I'm going to add another result block. In this case, we're going to say this is the SharePoint team, because we have it hard-coded that way. And I'm going to create a query. Well, here's my query builder. I don't have to stumble around not knowing how to create a query. I don't really care about the subject terms, so I'm going to take those away. But the property I want is skills. So I'm going to scroll down here to skills. That's nice. Let's go let that person in. Um, so here's skills. And I'm going to say skills equals, or actually skills contains, because they could have other skills. I'm going to do a manual value. And in this case, we'll just call it SharePoint. And I'll do add property filter. Now, how do I know I got it right? Ah, test query. Ooh, no results. Skills, original query source. I want to run this one against local people. Test the query. There we go. There's my SharePoint team. So I'm going to go, OK, you can also do sorting. You can choose how to stack rank them. Um, all kinds of things in here. It, it is literally a brand new engine to all of us. So I chose OK there. I chose OK there. That's back. So now when I do my search, what I should see I should see my SharePoint team. But look, they're, they're probably on the next page, or I probably missed something. Yeah, I missed something. Hang on. I think I did the same, made that same mistake yesterday. Hurry up and fix it? I will. No, I said Hank can fix it. Yeah, Hank can fix it. That's right. That's right. Entire query matches exactly. Assign that. That's all good. That's all good. Result block. Publishing. It's active. What did I miss? Oh, what I missed, notice there's only one. There are too many little check boxes that you have to hit to get it. Oh, here it is. Let's see. SharePoint. Setting. Change this. I want you to use the item people intent. Routing. There it is. Is this it? Let's see. Oh, this is the other one. I want this block to be at the top. This is that float option that I was talking to you about. I can either have it at the top or I can stack rank it with the other results. So it says may not show because it may not be as relevant as the other items. Save there. Save there. That's there. Should work this time. Try it again. There they are. There's the SharePoint team. So it's showing just the people that have. It's showing two because that's how the rule was configured. And, um, and it gives me the ability to promote. It gives me the ability to get in there and promote the results the way that I want my end users to work with my search results. So let me try one more thing here. Let me edit this again. All of that looks good. Let's do four. And go back down to settings here. 
equal intent item. That looks good. Save that. Okay, so I think I'm there. And I don't want to go over time. I want you guys to get down there. There it is. Okay, so the people intent item lays them out horizontally. You'll notice that uh, Sonny Heartthrob is in there now. Sorry, Hank get, gets pulled out because he doesn't have it on his skills. Um, that was Christina at the back, whose dog I just bounced off the demo. And, um, and you see him uh, or, organized by, uh, by relevance now because Willa happens to be the most clicked on um, person in my organization when I do SharePoint searches. So the click-through relevance is, be, is driving the order of the, um, of the results on that page. All right. So one, one search engine to rule them all. We now don't, we don't have SharePoint with Fast for SharePoint and all of these other search engines. We just have SharePoint search. Same search engine in Exchange 2013. Continuous crawling is something you guys should check out if, you're, if you get a chance. The, um, there's a new process in SharePoint that keeps our indexes significantly fresher. And, it's, and thanks to the search team, they've enabled this thing called continuous crawling that allows me to keep very fresh search uh, results. Search administration is now at the site level. Query rules, I'm just going to do a whole session on query rules next time because there's just so much that you can do with this. It's ridiculous. I do so much less development now. I do a lot more scratching of my head in the query builder, but I'm not doing development. And then um, no more XSL, now I'm doing HTML because I have my display templates. That's all I have. If you, uh, if you are going to be benevolent to me on Twitter, it's IW416. My handle is Matthew McD. And I will, this bit.ly, MCDSPEVO13, is active right now on a stubbed out page. I'll fill it up with the content, the slides, um, the code from my other sessions, things like that. Thank you guys so much for coming. This has been a great conference. <laughs>